Okay, so welcome everybody. <coughs> so yeah, my name is Gerald. I'm from Germany, uh, Frankfurt. Um, happy to be here. So question before I start. So how many of you are already entrepreneurs? Okay, so half. How many want to be entrepreneurs? The other half, I hope. <laughs> so and who thinks he's going to build the next Google? Oh, very few. Okay, normally you have many more people thinking building the next Google. So what I want to share with you is I've been, I've been for the past 15 years an entrepreneur. And I want to share a little bit with you my, well, my lessons learned really from these years and um, trying or hoping that some of the pitfalls or some of the mistakes I've made I can, <laughs> I can help you to avoid because of these are very costly always. So my five cents, just brief background on what I did is um, I did an MBA in the States, came back. Um, I worked for one year in a large corporation called Hoogst. Um, they fired me after a year basically because it didn't work out between the big company and me. So I basically just did whatever I wanted to do. And <laughs> the big corporations usually don't like it. So it became very clear for me I wanted to start my own business. Um, we did a small project with IBM at the time, building a marketplace. And then out of this really two other guys and me, we invested all our money in a living room really started with our desk and bought the computers and so on and uh, built our first company called Portum, um, which is a, um, um, a marketplace for large corporations to facilitate purchasing, something very boring. Uh, the mechanism was reverse auctions where prices would go down. So we started in 98, 99, and we had about 2 billion euros on this marketplace. We had raised about 15 million euros at the time already, 50 million marks still at the time. And the company was about 100 employees within this one and a half years, really, spread out through four different countries. And I was 25 and had really had no clue about what I was doing. <laughs> it just happened, basically, and the company was just growing. <clears throat> now, that was the first hype uh, into, in 1999 and 2000. How many of you have been there? Okay, <laughs> one. Good. Okay, I think we are in something, it was the time where the internet was something very new and everybody said I have the next big thing and they're going to really push this out, they're going to be the next Google. And you had obviously also a lot of examples of people becoming really rich. Uh, I remember um, in this company um, we did a financing round um, at a valuation of 140 million euros at the time. Um, and Accenture came in with 10 million euros and I got a call from a, from a guy um, who was a publicly listed company who was 1.2 billion and he said, Gerald, you know, why did you take this investment now? Why don't we just buy your company for 150 million euros in your finance zone? So I said, come on, no, 150 million. This is going to be a billion euro company. So it was in 2001, January, February. Now in 2001, middle of the year, everything exploded. So all of a sudden, those companies, which were worth a billion in six, uh, six months before, all of a sudden was 100 million or 50 million worth. So company where the companies were dying left, right, center. We, had, we went through a huge crisis because our business model completely tumbled. So from a commission-based model where we would earn, earn money on every euro traded on the platform, we had to change completely into a software as a service platform. I had to fire out of the 120 people, about 60 people. And I really, I'd say for the next four years, I'd, I'd dive down into the really, really hardcore stuff of entrepreneurship because it's not all shiny and rosy. In reality, it's all really, 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 really difficult. And every morning you wake up and you think, shit, what's going to happen today? So that was for four years um, in Portum. Eventually, we, um, we sold it um, in 2006 to Capgemini. And uh, together with my colleague, uh, Gustavo, we decided, OK, let's look, so, look, look for something new, go away from the B2B software world towards something more fun, a B2C business. Um, we uh, came across. This flash sales business, which was in France already very big at the time, with Vaughan Privé, we said, this is a great model, why don't we do this? So we started in 2006 originally in Madrid. And then within the next four years, we spread out through seven different countries across Europe. Um, the company was about a 300, 320 employees after, after four years. Um, revenues were about a million, uh, 100, 100 million euros in revenues. And the model was that we would sell branded products which we had sourced from brands like Polo Ralph Lauren and Gucci and so on to end consumers um, in time limited campaigns. So they would have two days to buy at a discount of 60%. And then after we would have sold, we would go back, buy the products and then sell them. So brilliant model, cash flow positive um, and really going, going through the sky. We raised about 25 million euros in that business and from Bertelsmann and others. And again, it was really growing and growing. So having learned something from here um, in 2010, we were at the moment where we saw that the market was changing again. And again, it's one of those learnings I'm going to tell you later on about 
markets change very fast and you have a business model one day which works great and the next moment or you wake up three months later and you don't have a business model, model anymore because everything has changed. So we looked at the market and we said, okay, here's a big change coming on, lots of competition, very low market entry barriers, which is of course a very big problem in these days because market entry barriers are really, really low. And then a lot of competitors obviously destroy margin. And at the beginning of 2010, we had an offer to get another 50 million euros investment. Um, but then eventually we said, okay, let's learn from the past, the first company where we could have sold for 150 million. <laughs> and we said, okay, um, Let's look outside, and we got two offers from, um, from well, and one of them was Amazon, and we decided in 2010 to sell the company. I stayed on for another uh, four months, and then actually did a, a trip around the world with my, with my family for, for the next uh, nine months, and then eventually came back and, and started something new, which is called Pippa Gene. It's a social selling community where we enable women to start their own business. Now that's the brief of, of what I've done the past 15 years and I want to go briefly through what I, I think I've learned in those, in those years. As a, as a CEO of a company, you really are constantly in that triangle of, of finding the right people for what you're doing, specifically if you grow a company from 0 to 120 people within 14 or 16 months. Um, you constantly have to look at your business model what's happening with it, and of course you have always the financing question because at the beginning very often businesses are not profitable, so you have to constantly look for financing and, get, and make sure that the liquid is flowing and the engine continues to run. Um, so on the HR side, my learnings. If you hire, hire the best because it really makes a huge difference. If you hire somebody who is mediocre, he will hire mediocre people. Specifically at the beginning, the quality of the initial five to ten people is so, so important for the future development of your company also that you really may need to make sure that you have the best people on the bus. And obviously, you have to give equity also for those people. But again, for me as a learning also, I, I know that there's a lot of these companies now where three different people start a company, they have all the same shares and so on. I'm not a very big fan of it. I think eventually there's usually one guy who is other than the others and who usually also is the guy who drives forward and he usually also in my opinion should have a bigger stake in the business because he will make all the difference. I don't say that the others are not important but usually you have one guy who's really important and also who needs to eventually make the final decisions. I really ask for references because you can never look behind somebody's brain. I mean, I've hired hundreds of people, yeah? And you always get people who are very good in selling themselves, and then you hire them. The next day you realize, oh man, that was perhaps the wrong hire. You know, you obviously, especially when you grow so fast, you just get people on. But again, really, really careful because hiring somebody wrong takes basically six to 12, 12, 12 months away. You have to find the guy, you have to train him. Then once you know that he's wrong, you have to get him out. So it's really, really bad. So as a CEO, I personally think that hiring and finding the best people is your most, most, most important job, what you have to do as a CEO. You have to obviously manage them, um, and, and I think it's a very personal way of how you manage people. I have a very straightforward and, and direct thing. Small learning from me, you usually, you usually are afraid of, of saying if you're not really happy with something, and you think you're mingling along, and then one day you wake up and you think, I'm really, I'm really angry at this, at this guy now, and you explode and then something happens. So I really believe in very clear targets, what you said every quarter. You measure people and then you see, okay, are people on the right track or not? And you give them also very honest and direct feedback. Now, to manage and leading also is dismissing. You know? um, how many people of you have dismissed people? Okay, couple. Not happy, right? It's not a great moment to dismiss somebody. Yeah? Obviously, um, because you, you've, you've, especially in small companies, you've gotten very close to people and you've worked days and nights and, and you very often have those people who work days and nights even, but then the outcome is really bad. So what do you do with these people? Again, I think it's really important to set very clear objectives and targets and then if you find out it's not the right person, be very straightforward and direct and really dismiss people very early on instead of dragging them on for six, 12 months. It doesn't help you and it doesn't help them really. Well, the culture thing, um, I personally believe it's a very important thing because you, you really, you create something at the beginning where the foundation of the company is built upon. So I spend a lot of time on, on finding again the right people and finding the right culture because if you don't have the right culture and for example spending like crazy, you will never get that out again. On the business model, 
I've, I see a lot of businesses, and I get per year, I don't know, 300, 400 pitches of people who want to wanna, wanna get an investment or who want to be supported or something like this. And many of these are really features. They're features, they're small little things of something else, and people think there's a business model behind it, but I really think you have to have something which is quite unique and you have to really solve a client problem where somebody is willing to pay for that client also, for that, client, for that problem to be solved. Um, on the business model, again, on the, I think the market size, I'm not sure, I think it was earlier on also, it doesn't matter which market you attach or you attack, it's all the same work. It doesn't make a difference if you build a small company or a big company, it's always a huge amount of work. It's 24, day, it's 24 hours per day, 365 days per year what you're doing as an entrepreneur. So I always tell people, you see, if it's the same effort, so why don't you just really go after a large market instead of being on a very small individual niche thing where you perhaps never, never can really succeed and there's perhaps also a lot of competition. On competition, um, in my first company, I was really paranoid about competition. I really looked always on left and right, what are these guys doing here, left and there. There's this famous thing from Intel, um, from Andy Grove, who said, only the paranoid survive. So we were really paranoid at looking at the competition. Looking back and looking also at the, at the other companies I did afterwards, I think it was a little bit of a mistake because you, you become paranoid by just looking at the other things, at the other companies, and you just start copying, 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 instead of really inventing and doing something unique and something new. So I've really stopped doing this. I say, fine, competition is doing it. Let them do it. We're going to follow our way, and we're not just going to try to copy whatever it is. Because you're not in the business to fight competition, really. You're in the business to build a business. Now, on the client side, whoever is in the B2B, <laughs> in the B2B world, clients are really important, obviously. And, um, and you, you have that tendency to, make, to try to make every client really, really happy, which is never really possible. And then in our first company, you have these large companies with the small companies, and they really took advantage of us. So we tried to make them all happy all the time, and eventually spent money and money and money on it, but never, never really became profitable with them. So really, make them happy, but don't be a slave. On the international, internationalization side, Again, learning from the first and the second one, it's very costly to really be international, really be international from the beginning. Um, and I've seen that again also in our, in our second company. We started with something in Spain, and then we weren't really ready to internationalize, but we did it anyways. So we started to internationalize, so we made the mistakes here, we made the mistakes here, and the mistakes here. What it ended up is you need more and more and more money to fuel your mistake making in different countries. So sometimes it's just good to build a solid base and then start from there. Now, adaptation, I spoke about it twice, those two companies I had. Um, the, the business or the world we're living in is so fast now, you have to constantly adopt and ask yourself, okay, where's the next thing coming up? Because there's something literally around the corner, but at the same time, you obviously have to really focus on, on, your, on your business and not really in your business. Do you know what the difference is focusing on the business and not in the business? You see, in the business, you go every morning. Every morning at 9, you go in there and you have these 100 things on your table and in your email inbox, which you have problems. Because as a CEO, I don't know, <laughs> the people who also have a company, you have 100 things every day, little things in your inbox, what doesn't work. And you constantly have to solve them. So what you're doing is you're running around this treadmill trying to find one, one, one after the other. So you're really working in the business. Who of you knows this Eisenhower matrix? Important, not important, urgent, not important. Okay, look at that matrix and you understand what I mean is. We as people usually focus on the A priorities, important and urgent, okay? These are the things, the 100 emails what you get every morning in your inbox, but these things never really bring you into the next development phase because they just solve your day-to-day -day problems. What you have to focus on is the not urgent but important stuff because that's the thing what's going to change your model eventually and really make you successful. So when Google, basically, is looking at things in the horizon and you have these future things, what, what, what's coming out of them in the future, or the Apple, uh, the Apple App Store and so on, that's working on the business because they really think of, okay, what's going to happen in three or five years and what do I have to do now in order to do it? Because if you don't do it now, you'll never do it because you never have time. I personally have never have time because you always have something else on your plate. Now, finance. Who of you has, has already raised capital from external investors? Okay, very few. Okay, good. So my lesson learned from it is um, it's a bit like a drug. 
You, know, you, 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 you start building a business and then you get the first money into the company and then you continuously need more and more money because the investors obviously want to have a return, they want to growth, they want to have growth in the company and you build a business which is really focused on exit. I, and I think I heard that also in one of the pitches. We're going to grow this thing and then we're going to exit it to Google and so on. I personally believe it's a very, very wrong assumption to do this. Do you know how many companies are exited to large companies throughout Europe per year? 20, perhaps, perhaps 30. Do you know how many companies are started every year in Europe? More than 200,000, okay? And the same amount, by the way, also fails. So personal opinion, it's a bit of an, of an excurs. Um, building a business to exit it never helps. You can have your exit in mind and think that could be potential buyers, but never build a business, personal, again, personal opinion, never build a business to sell it. Build a business that can scale and become profitable and be a real business for the next five or ten years and not something, oh, just I have to do this now, become the next guy who's selling it and then I have 20 million in my pockets and I'm off. Because that's 0.01%. And the problem in our days now is that people think, because of the media, it's all possible. Yeah, you have these some very small exits or you have these some very few people who have very big exits and everybody thinks, oh great, I just do the same. But in reality, it's not like this. So investors' money is like a drug, and then, by the way, one day you wake up as an employee. You start with 100% of your company, you are the guy who drives forward the business, and then one day you realize, damn it, I only have 5% left of this business, but I'm working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, so what's the difference? And by the way, I get a shitty salary. So <laughs> it is something where money raising is not, a, is, not an, is, not a, is not a purpose on its own. The money usually comes from the customers, yeah? from the revenues here. That is why I'm also a very, very big fan of costs. Obviously, if you don't have money a lot, if you don't have a lot of money, you anyways focus on your costs. But I'm really micromanaging these things. And I really look at the individual things because otherwise you will never really have control over it and people start doing left and right what they are, what they are doing, what they think is good. Partners, we had that before. Um, I'm, very, I'm very hesitant on partners. Um, partners are usually the big elephants. Um, and then you are the small mouse, and if the elephant starts to dance with the mouse, you usually <laughs> know what happens. So you are really the guy who is constantly trying to run behind the big partner. You think, ah, oh, he's going to solve my problem. But in reality, he's not solving your problem. So you really have to, have to get it on your own. And then the last one, legal. Um, what can go wrong will go wrong. <laughs> That's my personal opinion. People really at the beginning don't think of legal. But then they really have to make sure um, that eventually things don't hit the wall, especially if you get more and more funding. How many time do I have left? Seven minutes? Yeah, 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 seven minutes? Okay. Now, if I look at, if I look at companies um, or at, at teams to invest in, I look at these four things, and I call it AIDA. So, it starts with the why. You see, Many people think, my why is, I want to be rich. I think it's a very bad why. Do you think Steve Jobs, when he built Apple, said, I want to be rich? Probably not, right? It could have been one of the outcomes of it, but the why was not, I want to be rich. So starting a company is something, and being an entrepreneur, i come to that in a second, is something very personal. If you put your heart in it, it's something very, very personal. So the why is very, very important what also defines the company. And the why you can only understand is why you want to do it. What's your personal aim in your life? We're all here for something. It's my strong belief. <laughs> we are on this world, each of us is on this world for something. So you have to find out why. What's my personal aim? What I really want to achieve with this company or, with this, or, or, or in this life? Otherwise, you go in a very wrong direction. I've seen a lot of people going in wrong directions because they haven't defined the why, the aim. First important one. The second one, where I really look at people, which in my opinion make the difference, is people who are on the field and who are playing, or people who are outside of the field and who are just watching. So the people on the field, they constantly are initiating. They constantly do things. They constantly surprise you with things you have never thought of. These are entrepreneurs. People whom you have to talk to and tell them, okay, why did you do this, why did you do this? They're usually not really entrepreneurs because they're lacking the initiative. Because, and I'll come to that in a second, as an entrepreneur, you fail 100 times per day, and you have to get up 101 times. 
but you have to fail a hundred times in order to have one which works eventually. So you have to have a lot of initiative. The third, I call it decision power. And again, there's a lot of people who have great visions, and I was like that when I was young. I had so many visions. I mean, seriously, <laughs> I was on drugs probably. But eventually, people, pe I mean, you have to have a vision, it's fine, but the point is you have to get your, your force, your power, what you're doing, you have to get it to the ground and do something with it. And that has to do with decision power and making things happen. And again, personal learning. Um, you come, you come in your life and, and, and in the professional life, you come to moments where everybody's against you and says, no, 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 this is, uh, this is wrong, we should go in that direction, that direction, that direction. So everybody has an opinion and then usually, that's what I've seen also very often, is as an entrepreneur, you're very lonely. You, know, you have one idea of where it should go, but there's not really many people who believe you because you are the guy who probably sees a bit further than other people. The majority will say, it's ah, a stupid idea. You might have had that. You know, when you come up with your newest idea, you talk about it with your friends, you're like, what is the guy talking about? I don't understand this. So, so again, my personal opinion is, it's you have to have that decision power and that vision to make it happen and not let yourself be obtruded or basically guided in the direction of what everybody else thinks. Very usually, it's the great things which came out in this world were done by people who did something completely different than the other people. And you have to have the, the personal force and the power to stand for it and say, no, no, I believe in this. This is going to be how it's going to be. And don't let yourself be fooled by a hundred people telling you, no, it's never going to work. By the way, the people who are tell you it's never going to work, three years later, when it works, tell you, I told you, I know. <laughs> it was clear that it would work. The business we have done, the second one, for example, by VIP, there were a hundred other companies who could have done it. They all said, you're crazy building an e-commerce company in fashion, you're crazy. Well, when we sold it 100 million euros to Amazon, they, they, they didn't say anymore, you were crazy. So, but it has to do with decision power and making things happen. You have to make things happen. Don't talk about it, make things happen. And a plan obviously helps a lot. So have an ambitious plan and really follow that plan to make it happen. Well, how long? That's the last one. That's like the lachmus test for me also. I look for people who fail. I look for people who fail or who have failed. Because through failure you learn. And once you've failed and you get up again, you're smarter. You've gotten knowledge in your head. But you can, unfortunately, the only way really, in my opinion, how you can really learn is through failure. Because then you really understand, ah, I did this wrong, I have to do it next time the other way, and then you're going to change. And then you personally also change and you develop. And that's your most important and precious thing, what you have as an entrepreneur. You continu continuously have to in innovate and change yourself. And you can only do it if you, fire, if, you, if you fall down on your head a hundred times and you get up again a hundred and one. Now I really think entrepreneurship is not a profession, it's a, it's a way of living. A lot of people don't understand it, I think it's a, it's a profession. I think probably here I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. Last thing, you see, it's really important what you do in your life. When we were on this trip around the world, um, so we were in New Zealand in uh, February 2011, 22nd of February, so we were in this church at uh, 11.48, yeah, 22nd of December, and with, my, with my two little children, Philippa and Josephine. I have a beard there, hardly recognize me, but <laughs> it's me. So five minutes later, it was like this. Okay? So we were in this church, we lit two candles, we went out, and five minutes, it was like this. It was a huge earthquake. Nobody would have expected, obviously, that an earthquake happens. And it, it starts to make you think. For me, at least, again, it was a really big, wow, life is telling me something. My why has to become clear again. And it can be over really, really fast. So do something with your life, what you really can be proud of eventually at the end of your life. And you look back and say, wow, I did this great. And if I die tomorrow, well, I've tried very hard and I've done a lot of things which probably brought at least my vision a, bit, a little bit further because it can be over very, very, very fast. Now, that's the last thing. You see, my why is now. I realized I love entrepreneurship. I think entrepreneurs are changing the landscape of the world and innovators and entrepreneurs have the potential to change the world. It has always been done like this. It's people who take initiative and do things. So I said, okay, let's build a platform, let's build a company where we enable women, and our vision is to enable 100,000 women to start their own, their own career through a specific system. I'm not gonna go into detail in this. That's my vision. That can I'm very happy that you're here because it shows that you're also entrepreneurs. So I can only strongly encourage you to follow your dream and just make that, tap, make that true what you're, what, you're, what you're thinking about, but try to be clear on why you're doing it. 
Don't just do it for the money. That's one thing. It doesn't change a lot. It changes a little bit, but it doesn't change a lot. You have to understand why you do your things. So try to find that and then go for it. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to be like this yeah. because he's super <laughs> I can tall. sit down if you want to. <laughs> uh, no. Uh, questions for Gerald? Anyone? We still have like two minutes. Any questions? I'm sure there's. Ah, there's one. Swiss guy. So. Swiss guy. <laughs> yeah, Swiss guy, yeah. Um, I really like to talk, and uh, there's one question. If, if you would sum it up to one specific thing that you learned the most, just one thing, what would it be? <laughs> Never give up. Never, ever give up. In the darkest moments, never, ever give up. There's always the next morning. That's, I think, really what it all comes down to. Yeah. Sorry. Huh? What was your darkest moment? Oh, phew. Phew. That's a good question. Oh, I had so many. Mm -hmm. oh, it would be really difficult for me to, pin, to, to point out one. Hmm. I mean, personal things, obviously, yeah, where you really have a big personal failure. Yeah, you lose your, the, the person you love and you think you're, it, was, it was your wife. So I think it was pretty dark, probably. I think for me probably the darkest moments was in 2002 and three when we, when we had a company which was burning per month 400,000 euros and we were basically thinking we get more money and more money and more money to get the growth going. And then that big crash came and then and we had 120 employees as I said. And all of a sudden there was no more money. And everybody told me, okay, that's it, stop it now. Okay, it's gone, do something else. That was probably my darkest moment, but it was also my, my, my most important moment as a person because I said no. I said, I'm not going to accept this as a failure and I'm going to fight for it until the very last moment to make this happen. And we did make it happen. It was the darkest moment, but what we did is we said, okay, try to do the impossible. And we had like a month's time and we negotiated a deal with a, with a, with a client to pay upfront 1 million euros, which he did it was amazing for us because it was completely out of the blue. And we used the company to re we used the money to restructure the company and we went on. And everybody said, stop it, it's over. Just go to the bank and close the door. And I said, no, I'm not going to do this. Because I think you really have a, you have a, you have a commitment, you have a, you have a personal commitment given to the people who come to you and, and who trust you and who work with you. And you have an obligation to go to the last mile and to, through the last moment with them and help them to, to really go forward. Don't chicken out, yeah. It's always the next morning. Any more questions? No? Okay. Give a big hand to Gerald. Thank you.